Hi, good afternoon again, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're delighted you could join us uh, for today's conversation entitled Victims of Their Own Success, The, Lim the Lessons of Anti-Impunity Missions uh, in Central America. My name is Michael Camilleri. I direct the Peter D. Bell Rule of Law Program at the Inter-American Dialogue. Uh, we're very excited to partner uh, for today's event with the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies at American University. So over the last uh, several years, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador emerged as unlikely incubators for novel experiments in strengthening the rule of law against a backdrop of systemic corruption and structural impunity. First CICIG in Guatemala and then MASI in Honduras pioneered a hybrid model of hands-on cooperation between national judicial authorities and international experts with the purpose of dismantling powerful criminal structures and prosecuting the previously untouchable, including presidents, their ministers, and their family members. The progress and popularity of these anti-impunity missions led President Nayib Bukele to make the creation of a similar mission a pillar of his successful presidential campaign in El Salvador. As the title of today's event suggests, however, the very success of Sisig and Masi made them vulnerable to backlash from political and economic elites uh, that found favor with the Trump administration and led to the end of their mandates. In El Salvador, CCS uh, was announced with great fanfare, but has yet to materialize in any tangible way. Uh, so today we'll take stock of these experiences with the benefit of four experts with unique frontline perspectives on Central America's anti-impunity missions, we will analyze both the legacy of those missions and what may happen in the future, particularly with a US presidential election on the immediate horizon. The starting point for our conversation will be the research conducted by Chuck Call, a professor at AU's School of International Service and a former State Department uh, official who has written in-depth studies of CICIG and MASI, which are available on the webpage for today's event. Uh, a logistical note before we get started, um, we will be taking questions attendees can use the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, or they can tweet using the event hashtag, uh, hashtag anti-impunity missions on Twitter, or they can email meetings at the dialogue.org to submit questions for uh, the question and answer session that will conclude uh, this event. So uh, with that, it's a really a great pleasure uh, to um, turn it over to Eric Hirschberg. Eric uh, directs the American University Center for Latin American and Latino Studies. He will be uh, the moderator of today's event to also introduce our panelists. Eric, thanks again so much for your partnership on, on this important issue. Over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so on behalf of the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies at American University, I want to thank uh, everyone for attending today. And I want to thank the Dialogue for co-hosting this discussion. Um, over the years, the Center has benefited from the opportunity to partner with the Dialogue on uh, an array of events on um, related topics. Uh, this is the first time that we've done so in this virtual mode. And while of course that's occasioned by the pandemic, um, there is, I suppose, one bright side of it, which is that it means we're able to draw on a broader audience than would be possible if the discussion were to be taking place here in Washington, DC. Um, as Michael suggested, this panel is occasioned by the work that my American University colleague Chuck Call has undertaken over the past several years, uh, producing comprehensive reports on both uh, the Maxi in Honduras and the CICIG in Guatemala, um, as well as on prospects for uh, an analogous CCS in El Salvador. Um, and as Michael suggested, these experiences may offer valuable lessons uh, for the configuration of future anti-corruption and impunity efforts. Uh, and for strategies through which both domestic and external actors um, can be most effective in the battle against corruption. Um, this is all the more urgent today, I would argue, um, given the risks of corruption that are opened up by uh, government's responses to the pandemic. And this is a theme that I think will come up over the course of the afternoon. Um, we have four panelists um, ideally situated to address these issues. Uh, we'll begin with Chuck Call. Um, he's associate professor at the School of International Service at American University, an affiliate, um, uh, an affiliate faculty in our center. Um, he's done a great deal of research on post-war peace building, on state building, on democratization, human rights, police and justice reform. 
Um, in addition to his experience with the State Department, which Michael mentioned, he also um, has worked extensively with the United Nations, including a stint um, in 2004-05 at UN headquarters. Um, after Chuck sketches some of the findings from his work, um, Martha Doggett will offer commentary. Uh, Martha served from 2006 to 2017 as director of the Americas Division in the UN Department of Political Affairs. She also led the multidisciplinary team that helped design the CSTIG, and that followed on extensive prior experience um, in Central America. Um, we'll then go to Juan Gonzalez, and uh, Juan is currently senior fellow at the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement. Um, he's former U.S. Dep Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, um, where he worked in the area of Western Hemispheric Affairs and led U.S. diplomatic engagement in Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, in 2017, Gonzalez was appointed by Senator Chuck Sermer, Schumer, Schumer excuse me, to serve on the Western Hemisphere Drug Policy Commission. And then finally, um, we'll hear comments from Claudia Escobar. She is Centennial Fellow at the Walsh School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown University here in Washington. She's a former magistrate of the Court of Appeals in Guatemala. She was reelected to that position to a second term in 2014, but resigned in light of executive and legislative interference in the Guatemalan judicial system and has since relocated to the United States. She's also one of the commissioners of the International Anti-Corruption Commission in Ecuador, which may uh, come up at one or another point in our meeting. The sequence of the agenda is follows. Chuck will take up to about around, around 15 minutes to outline some of the key findings of his work. And then we'll go in sequence with uh, Martha Doggett addressing the role of the United Nations and lessons that she's drawn from the CICIG experience. Uh, Juan Gonzalez uh, on the evolution of US policy towards international cooperation to address corruption and impunity in the region and how this might unfold during the coming years. And then finally, Claudia Escobar addressing how hybrid commissions can buttress judicial institutions um, in the Northern Triangle. Um, at that point, we will have a moderated discussion. And as Michael noted, we'll be checking the Q&A and we'll do what we can um, to address um, issues that audience members may pose. And at the very end of the session, um, I'll reserve a couple minutes for each of the panelists to offer some concluding remarks. Uh, so with that, uh, again, thanking everyone for joining us today. Let me turn it over to Chuck. I might, I thought I did. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, I appreciate the work with the, uh, our collaboration with the dialogue. Thanks to uh, Michael, Catherine, and others there for organizing this for this event. Um, I'm going to I'm going to give some highlights of the lessons that I've drawn from both the research, the report I did in January on CC, and the report that I did uh, last month that was completed on Moxie. Both of them, I think, the links are have been posted on the, in the chat box. Um, and um, and I'll try to do that very schematically. I'm sure I'll miss a lot of points. At the outset, I'm going to presume that most of you are familiar with some of the basics of these organizations. And so these are there are certain traits that make them unusual, unique, I think, even in the area of anti-corruption. And one of them, as Michael mentioned, is that they're hybrid. They're, they have international staff and authorities that are mixed also with national staff and authorities. Secondly, they're consensual. They were asked for by these governments. They were not imposed by the Security Council or, or some other body. They are limited in time. Four years in the case of Moxie that was not renewed, ended in January, and two years renewed several times for CC between 2006 and last year. Um, in terms of their powers, CC could investigate cases freely, whatever criminal cases, uh, whatever cases that had to do with its mandate, which I'll come to. Moxie could investigate in conjunction with the Honduran Public Ministry. Um, CC effectively was able to co prosecute cases, but only with the Attorney General's office, not on its own, and Honduras could help and support prosecution with the attorney general's office, um, but it was only in the supporting role, even though it was de facto helping with a lot of prosecution preparations as well in, its, in, its, in the cases that it prepared. Um, let, me, let me just say that, the, so that's sort of, sort of some of these features of these institutions that make them a little bit unusual. And, and let me just say that they're, the fact that they're hybrid makes them a little different from two kinds of models that are out there. One is a big 
high, uh, large footprint peace operation from the United Nations, for example, which generally costs billions of dollars or multiple millions at least, and on, on, the, on the one extreme, and which often has more authorities, not always. Um, and secondly, on the other extreme are essentially your traditional technical assistance um, models, which is essentially what the US has been doing in Central America since the 1980s, giving um, technical aid and training and, and um, equipment to Honduran or El Salvadoran police forces or Guatemalan uh, judiciary, um, to the courts, to the prosecutor's office, et cetera. And so the, the hybrid model is something of something that's in between those in terms of its, its profile and, and footprint, I would say. Um, and that's an innovative uh, thing worth, worth looking at. The first thing I wanna say is that I think that, that these two experiences were relatively successful. Were, were relatively successful. Um, CIG's investigations led to the dismantling of 70 illicit networks with 1,540 individuals indicted, of whom 660 went to trial during its term and over 400 were convicted. Those included uh, ex-presidents, um, they included ministers, they included um, ex-generals, um, and, and, and some of the top, the country's most best known economic elites as well. Um, CC's mandate was just to, to be very briefly, it was to investigate um, Ill illegal security groups, we will call them in English, SEOCs. And, 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 the, and it, it evolved its interpretation of what those groups were to look at illicit criminal networks that were, that were involved in corruption in that country. Moxie's mandate um, was to also investigate, or also support investigations, I should say, of, um, of what it looked at, ended up interpreting to be illicit networks also. And so corruption, was explicitly part of its name, um, as well as impunity. And its focus was on um, essentially corruption. It ended up focusing quite a bit on corruption involving political uh, actors. Its successes were less pronounced than Guatemala's in its um, time, which was about a third of the, its term as, as Guatemala. It investigated 15 cases that eventually came to indictment. It investigated a few others that have not yet. Only one of those came to trial. That was its most prominent case, which was the prosecution, the successful, uh, and eventually she was sentenced to former first lady, Rosa Elena Bonilla uh, de Lobo, the, uh, the wife of former president Porfirio Lobo. Um, she was sentenced to 58 years in jail. It was upheld on appeal, but then it was turned overturned uh, on another appeal. And she was just released last week, in fact. Um, so that's a, considered a major setback to a lot of the analysts in, in Honduras of impunity. So it had much less impact juridically, but its impact on the political system was still wise. Its cases resulted in indictments of over two dozen legislators and ex-legislators. And I think the most important thing that is probably worth mentioning here is that the key impact of both of these bodies was to generate and uh, a sense of outrage and uh, that corruption actually and awareness on the part of the populations that corruption and uh, could be in fact prosecuted by national actors if given the political space and support to do so. Um, so people were really not used to seeing ex-presidents indicted and um, and, and CC in Guatemala made that possible. Um, it indicted three former presidents uh, and investigated two others and not counting the current president who spent 10 months in jail on a case that CC investigated several years ago before he was elected president. Um, you know, it's, Former judges were also sentenced in, in Guatemala as a result of CC's investigation. Uh, as one judge told me, a judge serving a jail sentence before this was unimaginable, he said. These are the kinds of sort of reactions that a lot of people generated uh, in terms of CC's accomplishments in getting at the highest levels of top level political and economic uh, fears that were uh, previously considered untouchable. When, they, when these missions closed, 70% of the population in each country supported them as they drew to a close um, last year. Um, and so that's, that's a, sort of the first point I wanna make, which is that these were relatively successful. That is not to say they were not controversial and didn't generate some controversy and didn't make some mistakes, which I'll come back to in, in my final point. But the second point I wanna make is that what was the key mechanism for the effectiveness of these groups? And that is, I would say, um, there were three, three ones that I'm gonna mention very briefly. The principal impact of these international missions was not its technical capacity building, but their political support or the cover that they give to well-meaning officials to be able to do their jobs without fear. Um, I'll just give you one really quick example. Uh, uh, a Honduran prosecutor said that 
when he went into the here, the judge to hand out the sentence to in a in a in a well known case of three hundred million dollars that was stolen from the Honduran Social Security Institute. It's the presence of the head, the commissioner of Moxie, uh, Juan Jimenez Mayor. He felt was enough to help ensure that the judge would have the courage to uh, hand down the appropriate sentence in that case instead of find some excuse to to diminish that that as well. Um, Attorney General Thelma Aldana, Thelma Aldana of Guatemala said, it, quote, it was such a great feeling each time we presented a case for the Attorney General to go before the press accompanied by CC, it sent a very strong message, unquote. Um, that's not to say that these hybrid missions didn't contribute in important ways to institutional technical strengthening and technical capacity. They did, and I can talk more about that if, um, if, if questions uh, permit. The second element of their success, though, was, was really the creation of counterpart institutions inside the national bodies, the creation of vetted, carefully selected um, court chambers and prosecutorial units in both countries. Guatemala was a high-risk court, and in Honduras it was called the National Anti-Corruption Circuit. Um, and these bodies were created and protected and given essentially um, they were specially vetted, especially the prosecutorial units that were created in each of these that just worked closely with these international missions. And they gave the political cover and confidence needed that they could prosecute these sensitive cases um, without fear. And they also selected people who were, who were less, um, you know, who they were able to vet out people who were considered suspect, basically. Um, let me just give you one real example of how important these vetted units are. The National Anti-Corruption Council, which is a non-governmental organization um, in Honduras, it has its own it's, its own investigations. It's still functioning it, and, and hands them over to the ministry, the public ministry, which is the Attorney General's office. In Honduras, it, it did 90 cases between 2014 and, and the end of last year. It handed 90 cases that it considered ready for indictment over to the prosecutors, the, the Attorney General's office. 15 of those made it to indictment. All 15 of those were handled by specialized vetted units, including uh, UFESIC, which was the unit in Honduras for this. None of the other uh, 80 cases, 85 cases or 75 cases uh, handled by ordinary offices made it to indictment as of the spring of this year. Um, the third element of success of this mechanism of these hybrid commissions was the public profile and platform that's given to them. In both cases, the commissioners in charge of CICIG in Guatemala, as well as the commissioner in charge of the um, initially, at least Juan Jimenez Mayor in Honduras, used their public stage as a way to pressure the government to pass key laws, to advance certain cases, especially when they reach roadblocks, shame public officials into abiding by their obligations. And that actually created a, a huge important profile in those countries. It's very different than what we see right now with CCS, the commission that's been created in El Salvador, where the commissioner is essentially not permitted under the agreement to make public statements and tell the attorney general or other public officials have done so. So um, I'm gonna pass on to, um, to the uh, a third point here, which is that these uh, missions achieve judicial gains at an astonishing lower cost than, than another relevant point of comparison, which is international criminal tribunals. And so um, there were specialized international criminal tribunals, not for corruption, but for human rights violations in Yugoslavia and Sierra Leone and including the ICC, the cost of those is over $16 million per indictment in the ICTY, the, the Yugoslav court, $24 million per indictment, and almost double that in the ICC so far. In contrast, um, Moxie's investigations ended up costing about $240,000 each, at 133 cases, indictments that uh, resulted from its investigations. And CC's investigations ended up costing about $136,000 per indictment. So that may seem like a lot of money in Central America, but it's much less than these international tribunals, um, less than 1%, right? Um, the fourth point I wanna make is that these missions um, successes contributed to their political isolation and termination. And so I think this is one of the complicated things is that um, you see when it indicted the former president Otto Perez, when, when it worked on the indictment of Otto Perez Molina and his vice president, um, in 2015, reached a level of, uh, it inspired people to come out into the streets and demand their resignation, which they got. And, um, and those two individuals are still in jail or detained on military bases as of today, um, awaiting trial. That success that they achieved at that moment was quickly followed by a backlash. And that backlash came because C started to prosecute a wide variety of, of sectors that had been its political support, including economic elites, 
including um, lots of uh, ministers, including people in the legislature. Um, and as a result of that, it generated uh, antibodies in some sense, which came after it um, and, and, and really criticized it. Even the president who, succeed, who succeeded Otto Perez Molina, Jimmy Morales, who came under investigation from the, uh, from the, uh, from the in, in a CSIG backed investigation himself. Um, and he became a very outspoken critic of the body, as were a lot of those. They hired lobbyists in Washington to, to mount a campaign against CC here in Washington. Um, and in the end, though, you know, CC might have done some things differently to help um, have maybe a lower profile in the constitutional reform process that took place in 2016, maybe. But um, a lot of that attack was essentially generated because CC did its job so well, in my view. Um, because it actually was threatening the impunity that existed in very institutionalized ways in that country. And that led to a backlash that ultimately led to its not being renewed um, and, and unsuccessful attempts to kick it out early, in fact. So um, Honduras Moxie also played a, an important role, but the, uh, there was a key factor in both of those and um, uh, all of this all along, which is the role of international actors. And uh, the, the last point I wanna make is that the United States support was basically bipartisan and consistent for CCIG all the way up through the entrance of the Trump administration, at which point it adopted a more um, ambivalent view. So on the one hand, uh, it officially supported CC and continued supporting it. But on the other hand, the Trump administration backed the president when it criticized CC. It made it clear it was not supporting CC. It, it sort of worked, it criticized the, the, uh, the way the UN handled uh, this mission and whether or not the UN should be doing this sort of thing. And that actually led to an opening for elites in Guatemala to successfully push the mission out. Um, and, and I think that that's also an important lesson to keep in mind. So there's many other points I could make, lessons about how long these things take and how important it is to set expectations among the population who have unrealistic expectations of very quick prosecutions. But I will stop there and thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, uh, Chuck. Um, that was a very helpful presentation. I would encourage um, participants again that the reports uh, that Chuck has written, um, links to them are available um, uh, in the uh, chat section of your Zoom page. Let me now um, turn it to Martha Doggett, um, who can reflect on the experience of CICIG and the role of the United Nations. Your microphone. You're muted. There you there go. Was. Yes, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as so Chuck suggested, um, CC existed a lot longer than than certainly uh, Maxi in Honduras and 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 CC, CCS in, in El Salvador is just getting started. We first heard about it. The, we were first approached in UN headquarters in 2002, and then of course it closed in September of 2019. Um, despite that long history, I would say it's still too early to draw some definitive conclusions, although, um, as Chuck said, suggested, it had both its high points and its very low points. And Chuck mentioned the departure of the Perez Molina government in 2015. There were three other uh, former presidents of Guatemala who also were faced charges in the course of CCIG's history. Um, but there was a time when CCIG was considered the model to be replicated. The international community and particularly the United States had been pouring a lot of money into traditional rule of law and justice sector programs for many years without much impact. So when the dramatic events of 2015 happened in Guatemala, it appeared to prove that a mixed hybrid tri tribunal was really the gold standard of how you could make a difference in justice sector reform in certainly in Central America. The UN uh, Secretariat in the aftermath of CCIG's uh, set up and appearing uh, uh, seeming uh, success was in fact approached by, by El Salvador, the government of El Salvador under the Mauricio Funes presidency and then subsequently under uh, the Honduran government, current government of Honduras about um, lending assistance to set up something along the lines of, of CCIG. Honduran civil society activists were in fact adamant that without uh, UN assistance, no commission would be serious and was therefore unacceptable. And the Honduran government um, leaned on UN secretariat at that point to help co-sponsor MOXIE, what became MOXIE along, along with the OAS. One of my UN colleagues used to, to uh, jokingly say that 
people seem to look at CCIG as though it were a piece of IKEA furniture that you could place your order, take the box home, screw the pieces together and, and simply set it up. Um, many of those who were expressing interest in UN ex uh, assistance uh, in, in, in setting up an anti-impunity commission really didn't, didn't seem to grasp just how difficult it had been. There, in fact, were many years of discussions and preparatory work, changes in government, unfavorable rulings by both congressional committees as well as Guatemala's Supreme Court. And in the end, it was a fair amount of luck and happenstance that finally led to the, the signing of the CCIG agreement between the United Nations Secretariat and, and the government of Guatemala. In 2002, there had been a series of targeted attacks on the human rights community, and there were a fair amount of human rights violations occurring in the aftermath of the 1996 peace accords. The justice sector remained weak, and those attacks spurred the human rights NGOs into action. They felt that a new mechanism was, was ne would be necessary to fight impunity and criminality, and they argued very forcefully that international community assistance was, was necessary. And I think this is a very important feature of, of CCIG's inception that I will mention in several different contexts, and that is that the project was originally a civil society initiative, which the government then embraced and endorsed as its own. Civil society activists in the aftermath of those attacks began reaching out to UN headquarters and in particular to the Department of Political Affairs. In, in the Department of Political Affairs, we had been accompanying or backstopping the peace talks throughout the process and then were the parent office for MINUGWA, the, the field mission that helped um, implement and verify the peace agreement. The strong engagement of civil society remained a hallmark of the experience throughout. And I think it, it that engagement um, contains some of the most important lessons learned from the CCIG experience. The activists arrived at UN headquarters with the plan of a commission already designed and they designed their, their design was based on something called the joint group in El Salvador. That group was set up in the aftermath of the, during the first years of the, uh, the of, after the peace agreement um, and it was meant to investigate the murders of FMLN guerrilla commanders who had been targeted in the aftermath of the peace agreement. At first, I was quite skeptical when we started hearing out these Guatemalan activists. I told the activists that Guatemala and El Salvador were very different cases, and without the engagement of the Security Council, which of course El Salvador had throughout its peace process, um, something so innovative and controversial would never would be very difficult to set up. This had never been done before by the United Nations. Yet it was clear to us that Guatemala needed assistance, and of course the UN wanted to help. But we told the Guatemalan activists that we would take their commission design as one input and that we would send in a team of experts to uh, evaluate the state of the justice sector and to design an appropriate response. And what it ensued from that mission um, were five years of planning, um, negotiating, political maneuvering, upheaval, changes in government, lobbying, and more. And it was neither a very easy process or a consistently forward lean process. There were times when I thought it was never going to happen, frankly. But it was through that very difficult process that we fully understood the need for UN engagement and that the UN Secretariat would have to play a major role in designing the commission and designing the parameters of the relations with the, with the UN national community writ large. Throughout CCIG's 12 years, member states looked to UN headquarters to coordinate and take the lead on their interaction with the commission. Having worked for CCIG on the CCIG file for about 16 years and watching the experiences in El Salvador and Honduras, I believe that a robust impartial uh, participation by a multilateral organization is necessary to make any real impact. And I think this is particularly true in Central America's Northern Triangle. Each commission must, of course, be tailor-made to national realities. That said, I think it's fair to say that the models adopted in El Salvador and Honduras represent a watering down of the CSIG model in a fashion that make the commissions easier to control and at the end of the day are apt to diminish their potential impact. But in both cases of Honduras and El Salvador, it's of course too early to tell. What we can do is draw some at least preliminary uh, lessons learned from, from CSIG. So I'll um, venture five. Um, first, an anti-impunity commission will not prosper without broad popular buy-in, but also support from justice sector professionals, politicians, and elite sectors. Throughout the long lead up to finalization of the CCIG agreement in December of 2006, the strong advocacy of Guatemalan civil society was crucial. 
Civil society activists did an excellent job at mobilizing the international community, many of whom lobbied the United Nations. Yet CSIG's existence must also be credited to a courageous group of Guatemalan officials between 2004 and 2006. When the CSIG agreement was finally signed, Guatemala's human rights ombudsman, the foreign minister, the presidential commissioner for human rights, and the vice president were all involved at different times in pushing the project and working with the UN to make CSIG a reality. One of the sticking points in our negotiations with the FUNES government in El Salvador was that the president wanted to place the commission within his own office and government planners were moving ahead without the support of the attorney general, who would of course need to be a key national counterpart. Second, CSIG was set up as a prosecutor's office reflecting the work experience of all three of the CC commissioners, all of whom were public prosecutors. We realized early on that the United Nations and our partners in, in government, the Guatemalan government, should have included an organogram in the agreement. We should have designed a commission reflecting all aspects of the mandate and ensuring proper interface with all national counterparts. With the staffing chart of a prosecutor's office, CSIG was not consistently structured or staffed to completely fulfill aspects of the mandate beyond casework, nor did it consistently nurture relationships with the Guatemalan professionals and civil society that are paramount to success and will help to ensure a lasting legacy. Third, another shortcoming in the model and the agreement was the lack of an oversight mechanism. CSIG was designed to be independent with one sole commissioner without a mandate from either the Security Council or the General Assembly, it was technically not what we call in the UN, a UN body. If a Guatemalan citizen felt aggrieved, there was nowhere to turn. I in fact had the families of some defendants crying in my office in New York City, and I had little to offer them. Nor did CSIG staffers have access to UN ethics or oversight mechanisms. CSIG would have benefited, benefited from a kind of office of professional responsibility and some sort of supervisory board. I should add that this view is not uniformly shared by, by my UN colleagues or some CSIG staffers. Fourth, strong international engagement was key to CSIG's success and efficacy. CSIG received no funding from the UN budget and was funded exclusively by voluntary contributions from member states, 20 countries and the European Union contributed some $175 million over the 12 years CSIG was operational. Fundraising, in fact, proved remarkably easy. And in Guatemala City, resident ambassadors regularly lobbied Guatemalan officials expressing support for CSIG at key junctures. And in the United States, I know of no other project in all my years of rule of law work that enjoyed such widespread support within the administration, congressional Democrats and Republicans, and civil society. As I mentioned, CSIG was a civil society initiative and owed its existence to the strong, dogged advocacy of that community. And at key junctures in CSIG's sometimes turbulent history, civil society activists set up a, a protective shield around the commission, fending off attempts by some within government and other detractors to either close it down or change the mandate in the nature of its work. Yet CSIG's relationship with, with Guatemala's NGOs and other rule of law professionals and activists um, did not consistently receive the kind of conscious, dedicated attention necessary to ensure its real success and lasting legacy. The international rule of law community and rights activists have historically focused on accountability for alleged crimes. And the focus has been on the willingness of a country's authorities in government and justice sector to actively investigate alleged crimes, crimes and ensure that everyone is treated equally before the law. Yet equally important to building a democratic rights respecting society is a popular constituency for the rule of law. Citizens must understand the implications of the rule of law and manifest a demand for robust, competent, impartial institutions of justice. This is particularly important in societies where the rule of law has never gained a firm foothold. By maintaining a case focus and not consistently crafting a conscious strategy vis-a-vis -vis civil society, I think CSIG missed an opportunity to maximize its contribution to building such a constituency for the rule of law. And finally, some observations on whether CSIG can or should be seen as a social change agent. 
While no doubt some would argue that a project such as CCIG should restrict itself to criminal prosecution, the commission's role in Guatemalan society warrants serious consideration. Rule of law has over the years become an integral and widely accepted part of the work of the United Nations. While some member states are frankly uncomfortable with the UN engagement in the heart of their country's justice sector, goal 16 of the current sustainable development goals agenda commits its membership to quote, promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all and build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. Under Secretary General Kofi Annan, human rights were mainstreamed throughout the work of the United Nations system and civil society and private sector actors are now valid partners for the organization alongside member states. While CCIG did not have a broad social change agenda, and I'm certainly not suggesting that its staffers should have been activists working alongside the country's reformers, I do think it would have been appropriate for CCIG to consider how its work was situated within a social change agenda and to be fully conscious of its, how its work was situated and the impl conscious implications of its work as Guatemalan society evolved. CSIG's casework served to unmask a multitude of issues, some of which pointed toward a broader reform agenda. These issues were best addressed by Guatemalan political actors. Yet there is a case to be made for a project such as CSIG to consciously embrace and to fully exploit its role within a social change agenda, a role which I believe falls within the UN's broader agenda and solidly within SDG 16, which currently serves to organize the work of both member states as well as the entire UN system. The prominent role that CSIG assumed within Guatemalan society and indeed in the country's interaction with the international community underscores, in my view, the importance of a more conscious positioning of CSIG's endeavors and impact within broader societal dy dynamics. CSIG's cases did not unfold within a vacuum, but rather within an ever-changing political and social environment. And in my view, even casework must be informed by these dynamics as one plays off against the other, consciously or unconsciously, willingly or unwillingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha, um, for those reflections from the perspective of the experience of the United Nations. Um, very helpful, both for understanding the Guatemalan experience and thinking about um, the role that these sorts of commissions might play elsewhere. Um, Juan Gonzalez, um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric, and um, thank you, Chuck, and it's great to see you again, Chuck, after a couple of years, and Martha for your comprehensive overview of um, CCIG and its relationship with the, with the UN system. Look, I, I was asked to focus on the link of combating corruption in the Northern Triangle with U.S. foreign policy, um, and I think Chuck and Martha have alluded to this being a bipartisan agenda. I think that's... that's um, that's absolutely true, but I think we got to ask ourselves why it is that corruption matters to the United States. And I, you know, we use the term corruption. Actually, um, I I often prefer to use the term grand corruption that has been used by Transparency International. It seems much more apt to this particular context, which defines which is defined as the abuse of high level power that benefits the few at the expense of the many and causes serious and widespread harm to individuals and society. It often goes on unpunished. Um, it, following the 1996 peace accords in Guatemala, there, there was a clear need to address the influence, the negative influence of parallel actors in Guatemalan society. And that's where the conversation of CCIG began and where, where the United States, uh, which started to really prioritize combating corruption after the Cold War really kind of took a focus and took years for CCIG to get to the point where it was, where, where it needed to be. But, but I, as somebody who was early on in my career, very much focused on the, the funding of CCIG. And then, you know, in my role in the White House, um, at, uh, was, was supporting the vice president's efforts. Um, it, it's, it's important to I think underscore here that the motivations for U.S. policy were were driven by a recognition that um, in in many of these countries in the Northern Triangle, um, you have a you have a, a kind of a system or an elite that um, that prefers a status quo um, of 
um, of not investing in social programs, of not having strong institutions uh, uh, of government, and, and having this arrangement where you have a constant flow of migration uh, that, that in turn sends my remittances back to the United States that drive consumption and then bear uh, benefit a, 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 a group of, of economic elite that exists in the country. It is also a group that um, for, for even after the 1996 Accords was, was very much focused on protecting the human rights violations that were um, um, perpetuated by the state during the internal conflict in places like Guatemala. But then also from a US policy perspective, any sort of effort to promote regional integration, prosperity, and a dem democratic agenda saw the corruption as a cor corrosive element that would undermine those sorts of efforts by um, discouraging foreign investment, by undermining competition, and by weakening any sort of efforts to, to create institutions of governance that would um, guarantee, the rule of, um, guarantee the rule of law, but also kind of promote democratic consolidation in places like, like Guatemala. So, um, um, so I think that's important to kind of say at, at the outset, from, from the point of the Bush administration and then the Obama administration, I think it's important to note that not only was the, the Bush administration, this was a Tom Shannon when he was the assistant secretary and beforehand um, uh, was this very active role in engaging with the Guatemalan Congress to negotiate a preference that, that made sense. Um, but I would also, I think, recognize the role of the US Congress um, because um, while the United States has championed its support for CCIG, I think you, you really got to point out that Senator Leahy earmarked funding for the United States to provide to CCIG. And I'm not, I don't know if it, whether Republican or Democratic administration would have supported um, monetarily that, that level of support for CCIG were it not for Senator Leahy. And as a result, at least during the early years, you actually had Spain, Canada, and the United States as some of the major uh, kind of the anchor funders for the work of, of the Corruption Commission. Um, so that's important to be recognized. When, when, um, when, when I started working with the Vice President, um, uh, the, the, the focus of the vice presidents and the administration's engagement on Central America was, as I alluded to, was, was uh, migration. That was the, the main focus on, and how do you actually address migration from the Northern Triangle? Um, and whereas um, often in the United States, you think about the issue of, of, um, of surges in migration as a matter, particularly under this administration, of one of, um, of enforcement um, and deterrence what, what the Obama-Biden administration realized was that, um, that the United States had a choice to either invest in, um, in billions of dollars every year in, in, in managing the flow of, of migration to, to our Southwest border, or to develop a comprehensive strategy to address the root causes of migration at their source so that individuals wouldn't want to, to leave their countries, they would want to stay. And as, as we, um, you know, as the Inter-American Development Bank and through the Vice President's Office, the State Department, the National Security Council, developed a, uh, tried to develop a, a migration strategy, and you may ask yourself, why is, what does this have to do with corruption, is, is, is what we realize is that you have the, the sources of migration were primarily marginalized communities that, that were really not being serviced by the state and had either an economic or a security need to, to depart. Uh, again, that you actually had an economic system that that, that benefited from um, from a flow of uh, of migration, and then and then lastly, um, that to ultimately address migration in the long term, it required structural reforms to to the institutions of of governing and the economic um, system in these countries that would allow them to be more responsive to to their citizens. At the center of all of that was was broad, widespread and endemic corruption that existed in these societies. And so therefore it became a central theme of the vice president's engagement um, in the region. Um, and, um, uh, and it's something that I think is, if elected, the, the vice president uh, has already announced plans of how he would maintain it as a, as a central, central theme of his administration. Um, the, Chuck alluded to this, as did Martha, that it doesn't matter what kind of system you put in place 
that the political support of the United States is vital here. When, when I, again, when I was at the White House, we had situations when the same, when the Guatemalan government called us to complain about Ambassador Todd Robinson, wanted us to pull him out because he was going to court hearings on, on uh, emblematic human rights cases, that he was really pushing the envelope on combating corruption and standing with Guatemalan civil society in this area. And the message from the vice president on down was Todd represents the views of the United States and he will remain there because he's our ambassador. And, and I, I can't underscore the importance of that enough. We can't take credit for this kind of broad spread civil society movement against corruption, but, but US support and the support of the US ambassador has been key. Unfortunately, under this administration, uh, combating corruption has been secondary. And uh, in fact, in the embrace of uh, leaders right now that have, are essentially unindicted co-conspirators in, 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 in Honduras um, have provided a cover to this forces of corruption and sent a signal that the United States really doesn't see it as a, as a key issue. And that has allowed the, the systematic dismantling of, of organizations like CC, and the allowing of the expiration of the, of the MASI mandate. So in the, in the kind of the two and a half minutes I have left, I want to talk about what would it, um, uh, the Biden administration do to combat corruption? And I want to acknowledge some of the challenges, inherent challenges in a C-SIG model. So the vice president has announced publicly a four-year, $4 billion plan on, on Central America. Um, a part of that, there's a recognition that it takes a very long time to negotiate a reestablishment of a C-SIG. And the question is, is the goal to have C-SIG back, to have a MASI back? I think that's something that should be part of the conversation, but if to take immediate steps to really start pushing back on the forces of corruption, what the vice president has outlined is a regional anti-corruption initiative that would allow us to work throughout Central America to partner with Mexico and with Colombia, recognizing that the corruption is a manifestation of transnational criminal enterprise that are um, that have outweighed influence over government systems in some of these countries. And to use the full tools of the US government to pull visas, to freeze assets, and to collaborate with those uh, attorneys generals and, and prosecutors and judges that are committed to combating corruption by providing them with the tools necessary by ensuring that the US legal system is responsive and collaborative in an effort to, um, to combat corruption in the region. But I will say just some of the challenges that, 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 that um, really gets to the underlying structural issues of, of, grand, um, of grand corruption are ones where, while organizations like CSIG were effective at um, making sure that combating corruption was front and center and um, that nobody, including presidents of Guatemala, were, were, were immune um, were, uh, from, from, from being investigated, I think those are very important signal, signals to create a political space that was created after 2014. Um, and CC did strengthen the, the public ministry. I think that has to be recognized as a central role of CC of actually creating this arrangement where, the, where, where eventually the, the goal of CC was to become obsolete by creating a system that didn't require an international presence. But I think we have to also ask ourselves that uh, arresting, prosecuting is, is while it's a vital tool in combating corruption, how do you establish a culture of lawfulness and establish a legal framework in these countries to ensure that, um, that you have a legal system that is accessible, that is transparent, that has tools that pr provide prosecutorial discretion to, um, to vetted prosecutors to ensure that you know, plea bargaining is a tool and to ensure that as a part of this broader effort to combat corruption, Individuals that that maybe could pay a fine or or could you know lead to big to developing much broader and complex cases against um, against some of these parallel forces are, are put in place. And I think that that in some ways is the is the unfinished business of CC and of MASI and really should be the the kind of unifying project of U.S. policy under a um, um, under a potential Biden administration. So thanks again for for the opportunity, and I look forward to the Q and A. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, this, this connection between um, corruption and migration is one that I think really does um, merit uh, emphasis. I mean, one of the ways that we sometimes think about um, the drivers of migration from Central America is that it's a region plagued by impunity. Um, and these commissions um, included impunity in their 
uh, titles um, aware, I think, or sensitive to um, that, um, that reality. Um, let me now turn to Claudia Escobar. The bottom left is your um, microphone to unmute. It's still on mute, Claudia. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I would like to share. Hello. I would like to share my my desktop. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it now. Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to to do it that way. But in in any case. I'll share with you my my thoughts today. So I would like to talk about three topics. Uh, first, about how the coronavirus pandemic is being used to undermine the justice sector in Guatemala. Uh, second, I will talk about you know the case of Guatemala as a reference to discuss how challenges that honest judges face when corruption is systemic and they try to do their job. And also, I want to highlight the importance of judicial independence when hybrid commissions can support judicial institutions in the Northern Triangle. So what is happening in Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador related to the coronavirus pandemic context? First, we know that there is not enough hospitals, neither public or private. The health system is collapsing. Most of the population live in poverty, and they really cannot stay at home, as in other places. But on top of that, corruption is endemic. And the judicial system is disregard, or is weak, or is inefficient. Uh, there is no secret that corruption in the region is a problem. And the money and resources that should be invested in hospitals and medicines have been misused for decades. Health system can respond effectively to the COVID-19 threats. So now everybody understands that corruption has a direct effect in every person's life. Now we know that corruption kills. In Guatemala, the last public hospital was built more than 50 years ago. Before the pandemic, the health system was already collapsing. So Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador are probably the most vulnerable countries in Latin America. Like other countries, none of these small states were ready to deal with the pandemic. Not only the government didn't invest in the health system, but they were not public officials with the knowledge, the experience, and the competence to deal with the crisis of this nature. In spite of that, Congress authorized millions of dollars to reduce the effects of the coronavirus. And there are severe complaints that if dishonest politicians are putting the money in their pockets. Meanwhile, criminal groups are taking advantage of the current situation of the COVID-19 to foster corruption and guarantee impunity for their misdeeds. One of the likeliest risks of the pandemic is that white collar thieves and corrupt politicians will use the crisis to appropriate money destined to humanitarian aid and all fill their pockets. For these and other reasons, criminals have the interest in controlling the judicial system. So as Chuck Cole said it before, most of the former presidents in the countries of the Northern Triangle have been charged for corruption crimes, as well as other high officials like state secretaries, ministers, Congress representatives, judges, and others. With the help of the international prosecutors and the collaboration of CICIG in Guatemala and Maxi in Honduras, a few have been found guilty. Others have been able to escape justice and some are awaiting trial. We need to take into account that corruption is not only a problem of bribery and using powerful positions in the government for personal enrichment. It is also an instrument of criminal networks to guarantee impunity for their crimes by promoting judicial corruption in actions that can vary from influence handling, obstruction to justice, conflict of interests, and other criminal activities that tend to weaken judicial institutions. So in Guatemala, those who, have the, who are at the for, forefront of corruption fight have suffered consistently from systematic mafia attacks. Today, empty health crisis caused by the coronavirus pandemic, attacks on judicial officials have floated up because it must be clear that when you fight corruption, corruption strikes back. The corruption and organized crime networks that operate in Guatemala and the region are not very different from the Italian mafia or the Colombian drug cartels. 
they use the same methods to intimidate or attack officials who oppose them. They slander or discredit them, relegate them to professional ostracism, accuse them of belonging to political groups, generally to the left, they accuse them of being communist, or attempt against their physical integrity. The mafia in Central America sometimes kill judicial officials for not giving up to corruption. I have known judges and prosecutors that have been assassinated for, for standing against corruption. Furthermore, criminals group have learned to cop the justice institutions since it is easier to neutralize honest judges and prosecutors when the justice system itself is at the service of the highest bidder. In most countries of Central America, judicial institutions are not reliable. In Guatemala, the justice system has lost its credibility as evidence emerged that the courts have been co-opted by organized crime, drug trafficking, and corruption networks. One of the main problems is how judges on higher courts are elected. At the start of the COVID-19 epidemic in February and, or March, one of the biggest scandals regarding interference of the justice system by criminal uh, groups was revealed. The Attorney General Office, or El Ministerio Público as we know it, discovered that the powerful politician awaiting trial on different corruption charges tried to manipulate the election of Supreme Court judges. Gustavo Alejos, who is the former private secretary of ex-president Alvaro Colón, and known for the misuse of public funds that allow him to become millionaire, was trying to manipulate the election of the court. This individual, which is a white collar criminal, was recently designed by the State Department of the United States for his involvement in grand corruption cases. He's been involved in more than six corruption cases. So powerful politicians that are in prison with Gustavo Alejos are likely support his efforts to influence the court election. As a result of the investigation, the Constitutional Court granted an amparo protection that suspend the election of the Supreme Court and the Courts of Appeal of Judges. The Constitutional Court established that Congress must carry out an analysis of the qualities of those aspiring for office so that the selection guarantees independence in the administration of justice. Besides that, it recognized that the constitutional established model for the election of magistrates has been worn out. But there are two reasons why it is difficult for Congress representatives to carry out an election of judges that complies with the constitutional principles and international standards. First, it is well documented that drug trafficking and international organized crime have already infiltrated Guatemala institutions and Congress is not the exception. The political parties with bigger representation in Congress have been implicated in different corruption cases or have connections to drug trafficking networks. Second, if the constitutional court recognized that the election model has been worn out, then it is not possible to correct the errors that have been dragged the process in Congress. Allowing Congress to carry out the election of judges in this context without guaranteeing an objective and deep evaluation of the candidates, it's equivalent to condemning the country to become a state without justice or a failed state where you know, the law remains in the hands of criminal groups. As of today, Congress has ignored the resolution from the Constitutional Court, arguing that it is an illegal order and that they can elect whoever they want. To further complicate the scenario, there is a group of candidates to the Supreme Court who want to remove the Constitutional Court judges for the ruling. So this is an example of how the rule of law is weakened by organized crime and why some countries need the backup of an international commission against corruption or hybrid mechanisms to strengthen their institutions. So I just wanna close with a few remarks of when do we need a hybrid mechanism or international commission to be helpful to combat corruption? Of course, there are different circumstances in each country but in places where there is not an adequate legal framework, where judicial institutions are weak, 
or where judicial independence does not exist because the executive or the legislative control the judiciary, or worse, when the influence or, of organized crime has been infiltrated all the institutions and honest or official are threatened every day, then the support of an international corporation is badly needed. And that's my, my thoughts about, you know, why it's very important to support this, these efforts. I know that uh, CICIC has already finished his mandate in Guatemala and also Maxi in Honduras, but I think that there's a lot of lessons that we can learn about the future of these organizations. There are other countries that are thinking about uh, creating organizations like that, like El Salvador and Ecuador. And as Marta pointed out, it's not easy to set up uh, an, an effort like this, but I think that we really need to study when, when it's, it's something that we have to, to back up. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, I'd like to turn now to uh, a number of the questions that um, people in the audience have posed. Uh, we won't be able to get to them all, but um, one follows very much from what Claudia just um, indicated, and it's something that I know Chuck has thought about considerably, which is what are the lessons of these two experiences um, in Honduras and Guatemala uh, for what a CCS might do, and what form a CCS might take in neighboring El Salvador? Um, I think other people might, might, might speak to this, but I'm happy to begin. Um, I think um, there already is a CCS in El Salvador, which was created, but it's very different from the, these two models. It, um, it was created um, by the executive without the legislative uh, authorization approval. And uh, it began operating in the fall of last year. Um, it has a commissioner, it's under the Organization of American States. It was created by an agreement between the foreign minister of El Salvador and, the, and Luis Almagro, the secretary general of the OAS. And, um, and it's a mission of the OAS. Um, it, has, um, it has many less powers than existed before and, and uh, than existed in, in Moxie or in CICIG, uh, including as I mentioned before. I mean, I think the, right away, I would say that the, um, the three things that I mentioned that are key to the success of this model are the three things that CCS needs to have. And that's a, a platform for, pu for public pronouncements. That is a creation of vetted specialized units to work with it within the Fiscalia. And, and, um, and that is um, the power to carry out, uh, to support in criminal investigations of its own choosing. So those are three things that I would mention right there. I think that um, it'll be, a, I mean, it's a complicated situation politically in El Salvador where the mission has reached agreements with the attorney general's office, but it's not clear what they're able to do and what they are doing. It's not publicly, it's not as transparent as these other missions have been. So we don't know what cases they're working on. Um, if they are supporting the attorney general's office on some cases of the attorney general's choosing. Um, and, and, and they have a, a very behind the scenes role which uh, inhibit its, its impact. Um, I think that one of the big questions is, you know, a lot of people, including myself, basically indicated to Salvadoran authorities when they were setting this up that the UN would probably be a, a more in, influential partner and make for a more powerful mission to root out corruption. That certainly was the track record of CC in terms of the UN's very positive role, um, generally speaking, of backing and giving profile to CCIG. And in particular, some of the internal uh, problems that Moxie had in its first couple of years were due to internal organizational issues with OES in terms of personnel, uh, selecting of personnel who weren't qualified for some senior positions and, and micromanaging the budget, a lot of money being spent in Washington for the mission, et cetera. So, um, so I think if, you know, it's, it's not clear that it may be that the train is down the track on that in terms of the OS being the, or, the regional organization that they have chosen to partner with. But, um, but, but I think the United Nations generally in principle is a better partner, but it's not clear what, what, what's possible at this juncture, especially if the president Bukele's Nuevas Ideas party wins the legislative elections next February, then that's gonna make the assembly's position to affirm some, something like that. At that. After that point, even more complicated. I'll hand it over to others who might wanna answer. Would other panelists like to weigh in on that? Um, if not, I think just following on this, there are a number of questions about the prospects moving forward for uh, CICIG-like or moxi like entities to be um, um, to operate in 
uh, Guatemala and Honduras, given, given the ongoing challenges that those countries face. Um, and there's interest among audience members in your assessment of the prospects um, uh, of the appetite in the, in the international community for uh, returning um, to support uh, missions of this sort. And there's, there's also a question specifically to Martha, um, but I think one could ask an analogous question to the panel as a whole. And specifically to Martha, it's about what was the thinking in the UN um, about not invoking the clause that enabled the United Nations to withdraw from its agreement with the Guatemalan government around Sisi when it was clear that the Guatemalan government was non-compliant with its obligations. And I think the same one could apply in the case of Honduras, right? When it was clear that the um, Hernandez government was systematically obstructing the work of Maxi, um, what was the, um, what are the explanations for why the OAS um, didn't um, exercise an exit option uh, on its own? So I don't know whether I, any of those questions are things, I mean, Martha, particularly with regard to the UN and CC, perhaps you could start us off. Sure. Um, I can tell you that it was never seriously considered. Um, you know, of course it came up, there would have been many grounds for, for, do, ha, for withdrawing the, the, the support and it was, a, it was mentioned in the agreement, but it was never seriously considered. Um, and I think that was because the engagement of UN headquarters with Guatemala was longstanding. Of course, we had been involved in the, the peace talks and the implementation of the peace agreement. And so it was natural that the civil society activists turned to, to UN headquarters and Department of Political Affairs to accompany them when they wanted to set up CCIG. And so these were people with whom we had longstanding working relationships. I mean, um, Vice President Stein had been the foreign minister when Minugua was started and then in the, the other end of the spectrum he was he had become the the, the um the, the vice president and so we knew we had a long working relationship with him the other thing is that we were under a lot of um you know what you might call it pressure you might call it consistent lobbying but both from the international um, community member states certainly wanted us to stay engaged and the as i said the donors were very generous throughout the, the time that cc existed um, and simply would not have allowed that had we made any serious move to withdraw the assistance. Likewise, um, and maybe Claudia can speak to this better than I can, but um, the Guatemalan civil society movement and human rights activists were certainly very um, insistent that we're grateful for the assistance and did not want the UN to withdraw. Was a time when I remember it was discussed that I wondered whether there were so many constraints on the commission that it, we might as well leave. But you know, as I said, it never got very far. But at the time, the um, the leadership of the Ministerio Público weighed in very heavily. That that felt that it was worth it just for the support that it was giving behind the scenes to the Ministerio Público in terms of building the the, the kind of professional capacity that they have, uh, have have achieved. I mean, there's no doubt they've come they've come a ways under the with the collaboration of CCIG and had some success in 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 some very real cases. In the case of Honduras and the OAS, I don't know, Chuck, if you have thoughts on um, the OAS thinking about how to grapple with a government that was not cooperating uh, with the advancement of its mandate. Yeah, I don't know. Um... The OAS was, um, I think the OAS had a, had a, had an attitude that basically was, was eager to have a mission, uh, has it from its own institutional perspective. It was eager to be working with that mission. It was eager for that mission to, to continue working. And it was eager, uh, not to make many rough, uh, ruffle many feathers. Um, at the end of the day, however, when the renewal came, when it came time for renewal, a lot of us were surprised that the OAS um, in the renewal negotiations in December and January, most recently, basically refused to see the point that the government was insisting, which was to essentially uh, gut the investigative mandate that existed in the accord with Moxie. And the OAS secretariat, to its credit, said it would not, it would not uh, support renewing a mission that did not have that investigative mission. I think there was, all, all, there was a lot of pressure from its own member states and from European donors, and I think 
from the United, the United States had a clear position. The U.S. Embassy had a clear position that it wanted that investigative mandate to continue, um, at least publicly. And I think that that made a difference in terms of the OAS um, not not wanting to cede on that point because I think they fear that they are they would have egg on their face if they signed off on a, a, the gutting of the teeth that that mission had acquired um, in the initial negotiations, whatever they had. So. Can I say I something? Say. On, on and and then the fact that the OAS is willing to continue. Uh, and support a very weak, a much weaker mandate in El Salvador shows its eagerness to uh, accommodate itself to member to its own member states' wishes. I think more than the UN was, frankly. I'm sorry, Juan. Juan. No, I, I interrupted you. So Chuck, I think Chuck is exactly right. I, I would also just um, so I mean, we're, we're, um, when talking about anti-corruption in Central America, there's there's a lot of focus on the role of the UN versus the given just the record with with CCIG. Um, in some ways. In, um, and, and please, um, other panelists, correct me. But I think, in some ways, the multilateral institution is is less relevant as as the terms of reference that are negotiated and how much the international community is willing to to use pressure behind the scenes to ensure that they are either ambitious or upheld. And and I and I think that um, I, I think that's relevant in the case of of Masi here in particular because. Um, when, when we were negotiating the, well, when the Honduran government and the OAS were negotiating the terms of reference for MASI, our, our, um, our perm rep, Mike Fitzpatrick, was, um, was the key guy behind the scenes negotiating what, what he thought was as the, the most ambitious, helping negotiate or getting the two parties to get to a terms of reference that were as ambitious as we thought the political bandwidth um, could bear in Honduras, or how far could we push the Honduran government to be ambitious? And, and at the end of the day, what we what we arrived at was a terms of reference that were that were we thought ambitious, but not nearly as ambitious as uh, as we wanted them to be with CC. I mean, let's let's recognize here that these commissions are, you know, some people accuse them of being a violation of sovereignty. They are a there are mechanisms for shared sovereignty that are negotiated with the government and they require the government to be a party to that to that arrangement. And what we arrived was we're like, okay, this is the most that we can get, but like CCIG, over time, we can try to build this into something that is robust and more independent and has the same um, tools at its disposal um, as CCIG does. does. Would it be relevant, whether it was at the UN or the CCIG, uh, maybe, but I think what was more more relevant was that um, any sort of effort by the Honduran government after the Masi was established were things where the United States, without without filling this role publicly, would behind the scenes say try to press for constructive resolution, uh, protect against the undermining of the the institution, and so I think that really matters. Um, and and if the and, and the United States has traditionally played this role um, for better or for worse. And, but I think that going forward, regardless of whether um, the Trump administration is reelected or, or the, the Biden administration is elected, I think it, the, it will require the international community to, to play more than just a donor role, but rather kind of like a political backing and support role where, where you have the international community that uses levers, maybe even that are outside of the scope of the terms of reference of a, such a commission to encourage that sort of behavior. I'll give one example and, and I'll shut up, is um, in one such ex exchange um, early on, um, I think it was in 2014, with uh, President Pérez Molina, that the conversation that the vice president had with him was basically one that said, look, you are the president and therefore you get to decide you know what is in the interest of your administration, but uh, but I'll you know make it fairly clear that if you don't extend the mandate of the anti-corruption commission, you're going to lose U.S. support in other areas, and I, that sent a very clear message that that Pérez Molina, even though it went against his own interests, had to support the mandate. Uh, and I and I you know if you read interviews with him, his his arrest, uh, his resignation, arrest for embezzlement is something he blames Biden for. For observing that pressure, so I think, so I think the terms of reference are important. The the multilateral institution that's involved is important, 
But I think even even more important is maintaining this this international coalition and consensus in favor of combating anti uh, combating corruption efforts. Thank you, Juan. Um, Claudia, one of the things that you alluded to in your comments was concern about um, accountability mechanisms for all of the expenditures that governments are having to make in response to the pandemic. And some of the questions we have um, in the chat uh, are um, re with regard to what are the kinds of mechanisms that international actors can uh, advance um, to try to facilitate, to try to minimize uh, the degree to which corrupt networks will take advantage of this particular conjuncture in the region? Well, you know, I think that these mechanisms are very useful because they bring a lot of technology, they bring knowledge to a country that probably doesn't have the resources, where um, the judicial institutions have not been a priority of, of the government. So sometimes it's like um, the judicial sector is the Cinderella of the other institutions in the countries. So that's why, you know, sometimes it is needed. I understand Juan uh, also mentioned the problem of sovereignty. And this is a, a topic that some people feel um, very, you know, problematic for these kind of institutions. But we have to think, you know, that sovereignty is really being affected by international organi organizations of criminal networks. And that is the real problem. And these criminal networks, they have endless resource, resources, resources that the other institutions don't have. So that is why we really need the international cooperation to strengthen the institutions. But I think that if we need to think in the future, we also need to think about organizations that can help um, on the modernization and the reform of the judicial sector. How can we guarantee that we will have courts that are impartial? And how are we guarantee the, the security of the people that are working against these criminal networks? Because it's not easy to be a judge or to be a prosecutor when you know that you know, you're being threatened or your family is being in danger because the job you're doing. So I think that, that those are things that we really need to, to put in the table when we think about, about these issues. And I think it's a great idea that we start thinking about regional organizations that can help because this is not a problem of a country. This is not a problem of Guatemala or, or Honduras. This is a regional problem and needs to be focused on that way, I think. Can I add something there, Eric? Yes, you mind? Please, Chuck. So thank, um, and this is a response to a couple of other questions in there, which I, I just very much want to agree that I think what we've seen, in, and there's a number of questions about what's happened since Moxie and CC have left and how, and, and things have gotten worse without question. There's a backlash against accountability. Um, legislature in, in Honduras passed a new horrible penal code that enhances impunity for legislators and others. Um, backsliding is definitely taking place in these two countries with also problems of uh, President Bukele's authoritarianism and well-known problems of President Ortega in Nicaragua. So um, I, I think that the regional level is, the, is right. And I just wanna point out, the main thing I wanna say is that I think we need to be more creative about what kind of platforms we create to exercise support for anti-impunity efforts in these countries. And that requires much more collaboration, active collaboration across civil societies of these countries, I think. Much more platforms of civil society. You know, civil society is very national focused in most of these countries. There's very little Central America wide organizing among civil society. And I think we need to think about more regional creative, you know, some ad hoc coalition that involves the Inter American Development Bank and the World Bank and the OAS and others could form some kind of regional mechanism that could support judicial independence, for example, um, and provide technical support for this kind of, uh, this kind of work. The Inter-American Commission for Human Rights has done great work at a regional level within the OAS system, but with its own logic. And you know, there's a whole anti-corruption bureaucracy that we could, you know, mechanisms that, of platforms that we, cre we could create at the regional or sub-regional level um, with our partners in Central America. Um, and I just wanna make one last point, which is people ask about the, the problems of um, shared sovereignty and, and working with governments that are themselves part of the problem. I mean, that's the problem with most of uh, the assistance and governance work around the world all the time. And one of the great things about these hybrid mechanisms is they lock in states to collaborate with international actors 
in ways that are that extend over time that actually come back and hold those uh, heads of states' feet to the fire. And so actually, Sisig is a great example of a government that most people consider to be, you know, beset by corruption that ended up creating something that um, came back and, and, and bit it multiple times um, uh, in, in, in its corruption weak side, I would say. Thanks. Your comment here, Chuck, um, mentions the importance of civil society, and it's something that, Martha, when you described the trajectory of the development of Sisi and of the UN's engagement, you noted uh, the important role, um, uh, the demand, as it were, coming from Guatemalan civil society. Um, and I wonder whether you all could reflect on um, the degree to which um, the, the MOXIE and the CICIG were able to maximize the opportunities that were available to partner with um, civil society support both inside the countries and internationally. Are there lessons to be learned from these two experiences about how civil society can uh, remain engaged and um, remain a, a force to sustain these kinds of um, anti-impunity efforts? Well, I could take a stab at that. Yeah. Um, as I suggested, I don't think CC ever had a conscious um, strategy throughout its 12 years of existence vis-a-vis -vis civil society. I think it was uh, each of the commissioners dealt with it in a very different way. And having been a civil society initiative and a civil society idea, I think some of those members of civil society thought that they could also control the commission. I remember that was one of my early conversations with some of those who took the initiative was, you have to understand that CCIG's independence means also independence from you, from you, from you the civil society, you, the human rights community. Um, that said, I think that CCIG really missed an opportunity to partner with that community. And by, by civil society, I mean, I would like to include um, you know, the, the bar associations, the law schools, the whole community of justice sector professionals, um, and certainly the private sector to try to build this constituency for the rule of law. And I think that any future attempts, be they region wide, Central America wide, or at a, at a national level, will only succeed in the face of what, let's face it, is going to be a very challenging, much more challenging environment. Um, and given the complexities in the political situation in the United States, but certainly within the countries, there are much more complex situations. It, they will only succeed to the extent that, we, that they have this community around them. Um, Juan poetically referred to the international community making use of the levers outside the mandate. And I think that's putting it kindly. Certainly member states were used very heavy handed at times, appropriately so in our view from UN headquarters. But in weighing in, he mentioned Vice President Biden's conversation with senior Guatemalan officials, but other senior officials from other countries, donors and non-donors, certainly the European Union as a group, um, played a very important role in, in helping CCIG to survive and have the space to work well as it did. And I think if any other environment going forward, any other attempts are going to need to take a, a full approach of looking at society so that, um, you know, a, beavering away in the corner of the court system on individual case focus is not going to get us very far. It may get some good investigations, it may get some convictions, put some bad actors behind, behind bars, but it's not going to help create the kind of rights respecting um, society, the culture of anti-impunity, the culture of anti-corruption that I think we're talking about, the kind of uh, healthy, democratic, rights-respecting societies that are going to help avoid the kind of outward migration that that we have acknowledged is a, there's a linkage between the anti-impunity and the and, and the migration. So I would like to think that we will look at any such initiative in the future, and in terms of looking at a, a society-wide approach to engaging all actors in trying to create these kinds of the kind of society that we're talking about. Thank you. Claudia, you also mentioned, uh, I believe it was you used the same term of the, a culture of lawfulness. Um, and um, I wonder whether you might share with our audience um, the concerns that were articulated in the letter that circulated um, a couple of days ago from leading Guatemalan uh, um, legal uh, judicial um, um, individuals and people um, in the um, civil society organizations, uh, former public officials, 
expressing concern about uh, precisely uh, assaults on a culture of lawfulness in Guatemala? Well, uh, as I pointed out in my presentation, right now we are at an internet um, institutional crisis because the way the judges for the higher courts are being elected, and there has been almost a year since the court should uh, have changed in their positions in the Supreme Court, and the election hasn't been able to to be done because there are um, very worrisome symptoms of uh, in, you know, organized crime influenced the election. And, you know, this is something that, that people need to know if we're going to have judges in the higher courts that are being there to help criminal networks to get impunity, corruption is going to grow exponentially, you know, and that is something that, that needs to be addressed and, and, um, we are in, in serious problem when, when the Congress decides that the sentence uh, or the, the resolution from the Constitutional Court should not be obeyed because it's illegal. <laughs> so, you know, this is something that when the rule of law is not respected. And we also have heard other officials in other countries referring in the same way to resolutions from the Constitutional uh, Court. So um, I think that it's something that we need to pay attention to. I think this just highlights that while uh, these hybrid commissions um, um, achieved quite a bit, um, we're also seeing today clear signs as Chuck described of backsliding. And this would be an example in the Guatemalan case of how fragile the advances that were made um, um, remain. And of course, it also highlights the importance moving forward of um, how both actors inside these countries, but the international community as well, um, can partner to um, foster um, greater adherence to the rule of law and to overcome the cultures of impunity that have so plagued um, the Northern Triangle countries. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left and I wanna give um, um, the opportunity to panelists if there's a last item you want to add um, before we sign off. Okay, well, I wanna thank um, all, all of you for joining us uh, in this call. I wanna thank the Inter-American Dialogue for the opportunity uh, to partner with them in this webinar. And I also want to thank um, everyone in the audience uh, who uh, um, took time out of their busy schedules to join us this afternoon. So thank you very much um, and everyone uh, stay safe and stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.